This video is sponsored by Legend Keeper. More on them later. Greetings gamers, my name is Anto and today we're continuing my series where I show you how to use the Affinity Suite to publish TTRPG products and today we're going to be talking about colour. Now I'm making this its own video because there are several choices that you're going to need to make around colour that are going to have big impacts on your project down the line and I think it's important to talk about them early in the process. So without any further ado, let's dive straight into this. Part 1 color space. The first thing that I want to do is talk about color space and profiles. I mentioned this in our introduction video, make sure you've checked that out so you're all up to date, but all the advice I'm giving you in this series assumes that you're going to want to print your product eventually. So when it comes to choosing a color profile, we're going to be working with CMYK. CMYK, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, also known as black, is the default color profile for physical printing. CMYK is known as a subtractive color model, which basically means when you add all the colors together, you make black, or when you take them all away, you end up with white. This is different to what your monitor or your phone screen uses, which is RGB, red, green, blue. RGB is an additive model where when you add more color, you get white. And when you take them away, you get black. It can be a little bit confusing. It's not something you need to super worry about. For our purposes, all you need to worry about is we're going to be working in CMYK. But what is important to understand right at the start is that these two color spaces are different and your monitor is going to display CMYK colors very differently to how they're going to show up in real life unless you use an expensive color accurate monitor. The color gamut of CMYK is much smaller than RGB, which is much smaller than the visible spectrum, which means CMYK struggles to print certain colors. We can get around this a little bit by using color profiles, which are basically small digital files that tell Affinity how to display colors so they look closer to what they're gonna look like in print. It's not perfect, but it will help you make products that have colors that make sense and look more like what you expect them to. Like I said in my first video, most of you are gonna be dealing with drive-thru RPG at some point, so we're gonna use their recommended ICC profile, which is the name for this small little bit of data that speaks to Affinity and tells it how to display color. If you're finding these videos useful, leave a like below because it really helps them reach more people. And if you want more TTRPG design and layout content, hit the subscribe button to get more videos like this. Part two, the color palette. Next, I wanna talk about color palettes. Like I said earlier, the CMYK color space doesn't show as broad of a range of colors as RGB or the visible spectrum, and this can be a real problem if you don't account for it. The most obvious color where this becomes a problem is blue. If you look at this image of the color gamut, you can see that CMYK really lacks in the blue spectrum of color compared to RGB, and because of this, blue is one of the hardest colors to reproduce accurately. So if you're just starting out, maybe don't make the main colors of your trade dress blue. I speak from experience. Because of this problem, I highly recommend you work with a color palette which is approved for printing. Now, the one I use is based on the approved colors for the printer that I use, which is Mixam, and I'll leave a link to it down in the description. Basically, what it's gonna do is it's gonna add a palette of colors into Affinity, and anytime I need to choose a font color or a color for a solid graphical element now, I always look for a tone from this palette first. This can feel a little bit limiting at first, but by working with the correct color profile and palette, you're setting yourself up for prints that look as accurate to what you expect as possible. And again, I want to reiterate that they're never going to look exactly like they do on your monitor. And you're always going to have a case where you crack open that fresh book for the first time and something looks a little bit different. That's always going to happen unless you're working with incredibly color accurate monitors. So it's much more important that when you open the physical book, it looks correct in the context of the page. Looking different to the PDF, not necessarily a problem because it's unlikely that your customer is going to have the physical book and the PDF open page for page referencing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. So as long as each is internally consistent, then you can design for the medium with each and they can look a little bit different. That's not a problem. Don't stress too much about it because I know you're going to stress. I know you're going to open that first book and you're going to be like, oh my God, the color doesn't look how it looked on my screen and you're going to have a freak out. It's only natural. I've done it. I've done it every single time I've ever opened one of my books, but you don't need to worry. Now, when you're working with a big print project that requires a lot of back and forth with proof copies and dialing in the settings and the look, the more you can eliminate the problems before they pop up by getting the colors right, the easier your life is going to be. But actually, I would like to know if you've got any experience in printing down below, and especially if you've had any big errors like colors coming out wrong or things just looking 
off when you've had something printed and what you've needed to do to fix them so that we can learn and grow together. So let me know down in the comments. If you're building a TTRPG product, you probably have a vast library of notes that need to be organized, which is why I'm so pleased that today's video is sponsored by Legend Keeper. For years now, Legend Keeper has been my go-to world building tool. It's what I've used to build out my homebrew world and I've been using it to run my weekly campaign for the last like four years, keeping all of my session notes, my player notes and my world notes within Legend Keeper. The thing that I love most about Legend Keeper is that it just gets out of my way and lets me world build. There are no predetermined templates. It doesn't give me a thousand prompts every time I want to do something. I can just create a new page and dive right into the act of creation. When I do want some structure though, there's a template system that allows me to set any page I've made as a template so I can use it over and over again. The main draw of Legend Keeper for me though is the Atlas. Here you can upload a map and cover it in pins which are linked to articles containing details about your world. You can change the color the shape, the size of the pins to make finding information easier, especially when you have over 600 of them on a single map like I do. And not just that, but you can nest maps infinitely. You can have a map of your entire cosmos with a pin to your world, go down to the world level map and then to your campaign region and then open up the map to their starting town and then even open up a map of the local tavern. Legend Keeper also has boards, which are like interactive whiteboards where you can plot ideas or story beats or even make a digital GM screen with clickable elements containing all the information that you need. When it comes time to share your world, you can invite your players to edit the world as collaborators or just send them a link for them to view the public elements of the world like a wiki with no account needed. If you want to check out everything Legend Keeper has to offer, you can use my link in the description below and get a 14 day free trial. And when you're ready, use the code LKAFFINITY to get 20% off your first payment, including annual plans. Thanks again to Legend Keeper for supporting the channel. And now back to the video. Part three, paper types. Next up, I want to talk about paper because the type of paper that you choose is going to make a huge difference on how colors appear on the page. And you're going to need to be aware of that. So for our purposes, publishing TTRPG products, there are three main types of paper that we're going to be dealing with. Uncoated paper, which is the kind of paper that you might find in a home printer or a photocopier. It tends to produce duller colors and doesn't reflect as much light. So the colors can seem a lot darker and less, less vibrant. Drive-Thru RPG uses some form of uncoated paper or something between an uncoated and silk paper. So your colors are always going to look less brilliant in a drive through RPG product compared to other printers. This is one of the biggest problems with drive through RPG as a whole, so you might want to choose slightly more vibrant colors for your drive through RPG print products as a result. Again, this isn't necessarily a problem if you're only ever printing via drive through RPG, as your customers have no point of comparison. But if you offer products via multiple methods, such as a Kickstarter print run and then a print on demand for regular distribution, you want to be aware of this difference and you want to try your best to make your customers aware of it as well. Next up, we have silk paper. Now, silk paper is the standard. It's smooth. It has good color vibrancy, and it's what you're going to be most familiar with from most major publishers. It's kind of the default option from most print houses. It's what you're going to find in your D&D books, in your Pathfinder books. Most of the major publishers use it. And wherever possible, if you have the option to print on silk paper, that is probably what you should be going for in most circumstances when printing TCRPG products. There are exceptions depending on your design goals and what kind of aesthetic you're going for, but 90% of you probably going to want to print on silk. And then lastly, gloss paper is mainly used by traditional magazines and it is a little more shiny. It makes the colors really stand out and pop. If you are printing anything other than a magazine, you're probably not going to want to use gloss anywhere except for a cover. Now, if you're using a traditional printer, like a print studio or a print house, you can usually request print samples from them, which will show you their different print processes and how it looks on all of the different stocks that they offer. This can be really helpful when deciding on paper type and the weight of paper to use when you're starting a project. And one more thing that I want to talk about when it comes to color, paper types, print houses, that whole package of things is if you are in the fortunate enough position where you need to order a lot of books, your print house might use a different kind of printing. And that different type of printing can also result in color variants. So for most small run printing, which is gonna be, you know, your handful of copies, your print on demand, 
most printers are gonna use a digital printer. But for larger scale print runs, then it's likely that your printer will use lithography printing, lithograph printing. It's a different print process. It produces slightly different colors. So again, you might run into the case where you open your book and the colors look a little bit different. This is why you wanna use color space. This is why you wanna use color palettes. And it's also kind of why you need to like steal your heart and be prepared for the colors in the actual books and not look quite how the colors on your monitor look unless you've got an absolutely bonkers expensive, super color accurate monitor. Part four, global color. So once you've got your profile, your palette set up, and we understand everything that there is to do with CMYK and different printing types, it's time to set up global colors. And this is the most important thing that you're gonna take away from this video today. A global color is one that you can set to be a unified color across an entire document. Any element that's colored with a global color will change if you change that global color. This is really useful for making adjustments as you work on a project or making variants for things like character sheets. In most documents, you're gonna have a handful of common elements which will benefit from a global color, such as your title text, your body text, your borders, any common graphic elements in your trade dress, all of these things that are made with solid color you can use global colors for them. Being able to change the color of all of these elements across an entire document with a click of one button is gonna save you so much time compared to manually adjusting those colors. To add global color in Affinity, head up to the swatches tab, click the hamburger menu, and then select add global color. That's gonna bring up a dialog where you can set the global color. And from that point on, it'll keep your global color in its own palette separate from the other colors. Anytime you wanna change your global color, you just need to go up to that palette open up that individual color and you can change it. Everything that has had that global color applied to it is gonna change as well. So now we know everything we need to know about color, it's time to start building our documents. And in the next video, we're gonna talk about master pages, the foundation of any great product. If you wanna keep watching, check out this playlist of all the Infinity tutorials I've made so far right here. But until next time, happy gaming.